Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, folks, Big Paul here today with Kurt Havens. We're going to talk about the science of protein. What's going on, Kurt? What's going on, Paul? Thanks for having me again. Other than having the death face and being at the end of contest prep. <laughs> what are you, three and a half weeks? Yeah, three, three, almost three. But, you know, so that's where I'm at. So protein is very important to me right now. <laughs> but we're going to talk about protein. Pro, pro, I think protein is a bit more straightforward than the other macronutrients we talked about. Certainly fats, is pro, there's a lot of nuance and in, in things you have to think through with fats and carbohydrates as well. But the protein is pretty pretty straightforward i yeah. think so i mean you know for people that don't know <laughs> protein is an essential uh, macronutrient that all humans need to live carbohydrates are not if we don't have protein we die more specifically essential amino acids and proteins are made up of you know we were talking about it before the before we got on the air but it's technically 20 amino acids that we need 22 if you want to be technical about it correct yeah i mean there's 500 plus that are present in nature but there's only they consider 22 to be uh proteinogenic meaning they make up actual tissue in mammals or living creatures and really of those 22 it's only 20 that we're concerned with because the other two are not present in you and i right, right. and then there's nine essential and 11 non-essential yeah and i'll i'll share my tab here and i'll show i've got a list so people can see what we have here for the for the essential and non-essential. So we essential, we have histidine, isoleucine, leucine, methanonine, phenol, I'm going to botch well, these, phenylalanine, theranine, tryptophan, that's the one that everybody thinks makes them sleepy, valine, and lysine. And these are the amino acids the body cannot make on its own. They are essential. So you have to get them through a dietary source. And the conditionally essential, um, you want to talk about that a little bit, the ones that are conditionally essential? Yeah, so conditionally essential are still considered non-essential, like we can produce them, but there might be rate limits in the production of them. So it's depending on the situation. A lot of times these are more in disease states than in athletes, but there are times when the human body can't keep up with the need. That Glutamine is a good example of that. So I've not, sort of like gut issues, you don't generally see healthy athletes in need of extra glutamine. Uh, I know that a lot of bodybuilders would debate that. In cancer patients and in HIV, you do see that, but that's more because the gut uses it as fuel and it's right. used intravenously. It's not given orally, except in cancer, sometimes it's given orally uh, actually to like swish around and heal ulcers in the mouth with the chemo. But so a uh, conditioning essential, I mean, you can add extra of these if you choose. I, there's generally not much for point assuming you're eating adequate protein, there's no studies to show that adding any of these free form ones are going to really do anything. And they're going to be in the proteins you eat anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, and we can talk a little bit more about the essential amino acids too and what, what each of those do. I have a chart here. I'm going to pop up on the screen. Phenylalanine is crucial for the structure and function, proteins and enzymes. Valine is one of the branch, uh, you know, I'll do the theonine next. Helps with fat metabolism and immune function. So all Proteins do have some role with immune function. Tryptophan, it's a precursor to serotonin and it helps uh, relax your mood. Makes you tired on Thanksgiving. Yeah. That's the one everybody hears about on Thanksgiving, although I think that's more a carb that's more mode. Carb mode. <laughs> Too much food. Methionine is, plays a pivotal role in the body's metabolism and detoxification. It's actually the first amino acid in all strands of DNA as well. So that you have three zinc fingers and then you have that amino acid. So that's kind of the lead. So leucine is a one that I hear a lot of people talking about. Uh, like yeah. people, people seem to so be obsessed with leucine. We have the branch chain. So out of the nine, essentially three of them are branch chain and it's just called branch chain because of the structure. If you, if you look, it has the way, the way it's shaped, it looks like this little branch sticking off. Right. So I'll do valine first. So valine stimulates muscle growth and regeneration. Isoleucine is essential for immune function, hemoglobin production and energy regulation. The leucine is kind of the most important, they're all important, but leucine is probably the most important for bodybuilders. So it helps regulate blood sugar levels and produces growth hormone. It is the stimulator of mTOR, which is protein synthesis. 
stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. That's kind of how we judge a quality protein source too, is by the leucine content. So a good protein source should have about 10% leucine in it, like whey, beef, eggs, those things are about 10% leucine. Our need for leucine also goes up as we age. If someone in their 30s only needs 25 grams of protein or two and a half grams of leucine to stimulate protein synthesis, by the time someone's in their 50s, they probably need 30 grams of protein or three grams of leucine, um, and it continues to go up. So there's something called sarcopenia, that's age-related muscle loss. And a lot of that is due to the increased protein need and the decrease in protein intake. It's, it's slightly hormonal as well, but a lot of times it's more food related, right? As we get older, we tend to eat less. Yep. And we need more food, more protein, at least as we get older. So then we have lysine, which helps uh, protein synthesis, calcium absorption, and the production of hormones. And histidine produces histamine for regulation of immune response digestion and sexual function. So those yep. are the, it's interesting how they all play different roles in the yeah. body, but uh, leucine seems to be a big one. Now I see it yeah. added into a lot of, a lot of supplements. It was, it was interesting when I was at Swiss this weekend, they had a guy who does testing for the supplement industry. And he talked about seeing like stuff that say they have leucine in things in it. And he was talking about how, like when they go to test this stuff, there's actually no leucine yeah. in it. When you don't, you don't want to add just so the human body likes to see things in proportions and ratios that it's, right. comfortable. it likes to see the branch chains in a specific ratio, like a two to one, one or a three to one, one at the most. If you were to just add straight leucine to something and throw the ratio off it, it the level in your blood will actually increase too high and it causes what they call hyperleucinemia which like a buildup of ammonia. So it's not, you don't want to use leucine as a straight supplement. So, so that's the thing. Like a lot of times, like when you see it in the supplement industry, when they talk about this thing or that thing being added to stuff, a lot of times it's just sales tactic. It's yeah. not even no. really, if you're eating good quality, whole protein sources, you probably don't really need any of the stuff. No. I mean, the most I use is like an EAS, EAA, essential amino acid, supplement while I'm lifting kind of just yeah I do too. Muscle, the same as you you know I, but I mean is it really needed probably not but I think for guys like us if it gives me one percent more I'll take that one percent yeah I mean guys like Dorian Yates and the those dudes back then they weren't taking any other no, stuff they were drinking water they were drinking water and eating real food so yeah. technically you you if your diet is buttoned up you probably don't need any of this stuff so this uh, begs the point, too, and I want to reiterate, these are essential. Your body does not make these on its own. You have to get them from dietary sources. And a lot of people, and we'll, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but especially people that are running vegan and vegetarian diets, a lot of them are deficient in essential amino acids. Not always. I mean, you, you can... You can do that, but the quality of a protein source, we can talk about complete protein sources. So not all protein is que created equal. There, there are different protein sources that have the right balance of amino, amino acids, or correct amino acid profile. It was interesting. I was looking it up and they said the most perfect protein source for humans is human breast milk. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Right. I mean, that literally is designed for us. Right. It was breast milk, whey, egg, yep. and then beef, I think, were the, yep. were the top protein sources for complete protein. Now, the, what you're not considering here, that while that may be you know, milk products or dairy products may be up there, it's the digestibility of it, too. So it doesn't matter if I'll get guys that argue with me all the time about whey protein, like whey protein's way more of a complete pro protein source than whatever xyz thing that you're eating why don't you just eat whey all the time it's because of the gut distress that it causes yeah well especially with concentrate isolate's okay but again yeah. so that's be starving all the time yeah yeah but that's that's concentrate. another issue too is you need sustained amino acid levels in the bloodstream yeah. so it's in and out so quick that there's I, I'll, I'll use a protein shake here and there but what i found that if i'm running protein shakes even isolates there's still people that have whey intolerances even though there's very little lactose in it there's other it, immune like fractions in it that can cause immune responses. right my rule of thumb is if you're farting from this stuff if you're running it's around gas it's not good it's a sign that you're not absorbing all of it so there's no point even though 
way arguably would be a more complete protein source you're probably not utilizing it properly yeah so i would like what i do is it, i would rather use it if i were going to miss a meal but i wouldn't necessarily replace a meal on purpose with it if that makes right sense. you know I'll like, sometimes what i'll do Kurt, like uh if i want pre-workout if i want to keep my meal light a lot of times i don't want my stomach to be bogged down with a bunch of food pre-workout i will maybe do half my protein from yeah yeah. a protein shake so like maybe i'll have a little piece of cod some rice and half a protein shake because it just sits easy in my stomach and i'm not burping it up while i yeah while i work out or post-workout or something like that we briefly touched on it but the vegan con conundrum here and i know this is probably going to upset some people and i have worked with vegan clients you can you can do it but you have to pay yeah. extra attention to detail it is extremely difficult and the problem you run into, and I'm going to share a macronutrient breakdown of <laughs> the issue that you run into, there, it's not just protein in the protein sources. So most vegan and vegetarian protein sources are going to have either a ton of carbs or a ton, a ton of, of fats. fats in them. So you're going to have oh. extra calories in there to get a complete amino acid profile. And so we'll, I'll throw up the example of beans and rice. So, so beans by themselves are not a complete amino acid profile and rice by itself, but you put the two together and you have a complete amino acid profile. So, but what but. you can see here to get 16 grams of protein from beans and rice, you have to eat 420 calories. There's 69 total grams of carbs. And the issue there is let's say if you wanted to push up to 50, yeah, you're quite, I mean, yeah. you're talking about having a 15, 1600 calorie meal in <laughs> 200 plus grams of carbs you cannot improve your body composition that way you're just going to get fat yeah with all I, and i i won't go into too much depth on it but i told you previously i had a personal experience where i tried to be a vegetarian when i was in college and my health failed miserably really quickly it was not a pleasant thing and i had no idea why because my assumption was well i'm not eating meat and i'm healthy but meanwhile i was becoming diabetic and having anxiety attacks my hair was falling out what I've seen in vegans, and I've talked to a couple of people, is severe B12 deficiency, where they end up with neuropathy and other issues, or it's other micronutrient deficiencies, or they're deficient in essential amino acids, Curtin. And you know what happens when you're deficient in essential amino acids? You will destroy your muscle. Everything. Your body breaks down. Everything breaks down. Yeah, your body starts eating up its own tissue to get yep. those essential amino acids. Yeah. All right, so protein requirements. I did some digging on it, and I, I've talked about it in the past. It's less than what bodybuilders think, and it's more than what the average person thinks. It's somewhere there in the middle. And from what I found from research studies, the absolute minimum to live, and this is for a non-active, non-weightlifting person, is 0 0.034 per pound of body weight. So if you're a 200 pound man you're talking about 68 grams of protein just to stay alive Complete yeah the proteins. rda is the rda is 0.8 grams per kilogram yeah which is that the is same. the absolute minimum for a just sedentary person to stay alive the american college of sports medicine they recently i think it was recently they updated their protein requirements they pushed them up they are now recommending 0.5 to 0.8 grams preferably on the higher end, 0.8 grams per pound of body weight for athletes. Pound. Yep. Now, keep in mind the studies that they derive that from are on non-enhanced athletes. That's yep. not our cohort. Yep. We're not talking about people that are using PEDs. But with my diet, I'll run as low as 0.8 grams on my high-carb days sometimes just to make food easy to digest. And so I don't have the protein weighing me down, but you don't need a ton on because carbs are protein-sparing. And we know that for, for enhanced athletes, there's really no studies or data. We just have our anecdotal real life experiences to go by. But from what I found, it's I've seen anywhere from one gram as high as two grams per pound of body weight. Some of the old school 90s, early 2000s body, bodybuilders were running two grams per pound of body weight. Guys now seem to be eating less. I typically run my diet somewhere between a gram and a gram and a quarter per pound of body weight. I may push it up on contest prep since we're cutting carbs back because it's, we talked about it before, it's basically impossible to turn protein into yeah. fat and it's satiating when you're st starved. 
Uh, there, there's really no downside. Well, not any big downsides to eating more protein other than affecting digestion and it being very expensive. That's expensive. Yeah. It looks like, like you said, so, you know, a gram per pound seems to be about the standard, right? That's recommended yeah. now. And that's a pretty good place for most people to run, whether they're enhanced or not. Um, I and I like to play it a little safe. So I would say, you know, let's, let's be a conservative and we'll, we'll just overshoot it a little bit. So yeah. a gram and a quarter, yeah. I think is. Yeah. Is I was just doing a round number for people, yeah. right? A lot of people get freaked out. They have trouble getting that much protein in. Like if you, if you're, for most people, if you're hitting a gram, then you're probably fine. Now, when I measure my food, I'm only counting direct protein sources. I'm not yes, counting indirect, like the couple grams that might be from the rice that I eat or whatever. I'm just counting yeah. protein sources from animal based proteins as that um right. as that number yeah. so that and Todd ram- was me the other day we were looking at my rice consumption he said well you eat 400 grams of protein a day 400 grams where do i get that from he said well your rice consumption i don't really i'm not really counting that i'm not sure it really has like almost no biological value so it's yeah. not something that i really think humans are getting that doesn't mean an animal can't extract it from i don't think i'm getting anything out of that no um, not much so I found two studies, though, on the way high end. I wanted to find what the most extreme amount of protein was that showed a positive yeah, result. And there were two that showed 4.4 grams per kilogram. Holy crap. So for a 220-pound for a man, that's 440 grams. And, to, and so to, we'll put that against the RDA. So the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram. That's 63 grams of protein for a 175-pound person. If you use this 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 study with this maximum amount, that's 349 grams of the same 175 pound person. And in both studies, one was in sedentary people and the other was in athletes. And in both studies, the subjects gained muscle. Wow, gained that's no impressive. Fat. No fat was gained. They gained muscle mass. Uh, now that doesn't mean I recommend that people should go eat, you know, three times their body weight and protein, but it's kind of interesting to see what happens. Well, I, we've talked about it before and you can explain it, but it's damn near impossible to turn protein into body fat. And you know, you, why don't you go through, we talked about it in some of the yeah, other I videos, mean, recap the, the, the process. Things, yeah. I mean, three things basically happen if you eat too much protein. The first is it increases the oxidation, right? The first thing that's going to happen is you're just going to start burning more in in the act of digestion, your body's just going to start destroying it for energy. You will enhance urea production, which is where nitrogen loss comes from. So the more, if you start, you know, increasing your protein dramatically, your body's just going to excrete more nitrogen and more ammonia, urea. It, it just can't deal with it. So it's just going to get rid of the excess. And then so the that's last why is, when you see guys that are eating high protein diets, they'll have high BUN on their yeah. blood work. And they, and your piss, I don't know, like in contest press I've had, where urine actually smells like, ammonia at some point like yeah the foamy ammonia um and the last thing is gluconeogenesis so that's what paul was talking about so if you have a huge excess of it you'll basically start making glucose out of some of it but the rate is so slow it's such a poor substrate for energy that it yields like five grams of glucose in an hour it's like a packet of sugar and so in order for you to then to store that as fat I'm not even sure what the rate of fat stored to be at five grams of glucose an hour. I don't think the human body can even do that. It would, no. it would metabolize the, assuming that was the only sort of source of glucose you had, it's not going to do that. Now I will get the carnivore guys arguing with me about having a high protein diet and they'll use all those as the compelling argument for running a carnivore diet. But the thing they forget is the high fat protein choices yeah. that they're making. You can still yeah. get fat, from eating yeah, a crap protein, ton of like fat. fat part that's doing it. Right. It's not the protein that's making you fat. It's the ribeye with the yeah. 30 or 40 or 50 grams of saturated fat with cooked over pan with melted or clarified butter in it. That's what's making you fat. It's yeah. not and, that, and I wouldn't want to do it, but if you if you took in, you know, 500 grams from whey protein isolate, which is literally just pure or egg whites, there would be no fat storage at all. Yeah, I would I wouldn't my, either though, but I would smell like a toxic waste dump if I eat that much whey protein. <laughs> um, I remember, Kurt, when I was in my 20s, I tried the two grams per pound of body weight protein. <laughs> did it with Dante? Yeah, I did it with Dante, and like half my protein came from protein powder. I farted so much. It was yeah, and you awful. You probably gained no more weight than you did with gram, right? Yeah, it was It was weird. Yeah, no, no, I, I look better now. Yeah, it was it was interesting, but <laughs> your stomach probably was distended. Oh my god, my stomach was completely bloated, and that may be a reason too why a lot of those old guys yep. their stomach hung out. Their stomach hung out. It's not the GH. It's there was no. just a bunch of 
fecal matter yeah and well, inflammation the, in their intestines we can do a we can do a whole nother one on this but part of the reason is when you in the 90s they were crushing their estrogen so when you crush your estrogen you stop bile production so you see in postmenopausal women that's why they have digestion issues once they go through menopause and so you can without bile you can't digest protein or fat and then on top of it, they're eating two grams of protein a day, right? They're now cutting their carbs and cutting their salts. So and now they can't transport anything. And it's just festering in their stomach and can't pass through. Yeah. When I'm at the end of contest prep, I'll add in ox bile when I'm crushing mine. Yeah. But it's definitely not a growth hormone thing. No. Growth hormone should make your way smaller, not larger. No, it's not a growth hormone thing. Yeah. So anyway, that was a side side yeah. rant on that. Let's let's talk about protein metabolism a little bit. So this is cool. probably so, an oversimplification. No, I mean, I was gonna mine was gonna be about a, the same thing. I was just gonna start in the mouth and say basically you start with mechanical digestion in the mouth when you're chewing food, and then it's gonna pass through to your stomach and you have pepsin, which is gonna start breaking it down. I think it's says it says protein will start to be broken down. So pepsin's doing the stomach part and then circulation. Circulation, they're claiming circulations out of three intestine. I was going to say, uh, in the small intestine, you have pancreatic enzymes and what they call brush border enzymes. And that's when it starts to be broken down even further into peptides and it starts to get absorbed through that part. That's when most amino acids and most peptides come out, pulled out through the small intestine. And then in the large intestine is basically when the nitrogen part is absorbed and then that will go to the liver. And then there's microbial metabolism as well. So then whatever's left in your gut microbe will, will, will break down the rest of the protein. And that's probably yeah. what you're smelling from the protein yeah. farts from yeah. the whey protein that it's most yeah, of so the, Then it says the liver extracts, which is interesting because it brings us to a point that this is 30% of amino acids will ingest into the circulation. Kind of an interesting thing too that most people don't realize is it takes, I'll give some numbers for people, it takes 220 grams of protein to make one pound of muscle. Right, but only ten percent of amino acids that you ingest actually make it to muscle. So, like you eat fifty grams of protein, people assume that your post workout shake or meal or something, all that protein is going, or that your body has a lot more important things it wants to do with protein, and so only ten percent is going to make it there. So, in theory, then it takes twenty two hundred grams of protein to make one pound of muscle. Wow, that's interesting. It's a lot, right? So that's when guys are saying, you know, they're gaining, you know, three pounds a week technically not really possible because you can't really retain enough protein in order to do that. There's obviously think, other ways. And I think that. this goes, goes into it. Oh yeah. There you go. But yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's actually very little of it actually makes it into the, I mean, there's even that, I mean, when you think about, I, I, what is it like 70% of the muscle is actually water anyway. So yeah. how much protein structures are there really in a pound of muscle? It's, it's like 16% or something. Yeah, it's very low, but you can see here where, where things are utilized. Now I would assume that the 2% per day for muscle is probably a little different in our. Yeah. Our so graphic. it's, what's interesting. I was going to bring this part up too, is it talks about the, the proteolysis. So the breakdown, most people don't realize you lose between 300 and 400 grams a day of, of amino acids. Everybody does. You lose all day long is a constant turnover. And so it's one of the reasons why you need to eat protein every day because you're constantly losing a huge amount. And for most people, not bodybuilders, this ratio synthesis and breakdown should be is equal, right? That's like that they're just in perfect nitrogen balance. They're excreting and they're gaining the same rate. So their weight's not shifting. You and I honestly want to be more on the synthesis side, right? Versus the- We want a positive nitrogen balance, correct? Yep. And to put this in perspective for bodybuilders, so if you lose- if you're losing three to 400 grams a day just from your amino acid pool, if you took 100 milligrams of nandrolone to can of weight specifically, MPP is less. If you took 100 milligrams of DECA, it would hold 52 grams of nitrogen a day for 14 days. So, which is a lot if you think about it, but it's still not enough without food to cover the loss that your body's just naturally going to experience anyway. And that's without exercise. Yep. So that's the increased nitrogen retention that the anabolic yeah. causes. So, and, that, and that pretty much, at, as far as I'm aware, has the highest nitrogen retention. Of yeah. I, yeah. I thought nandrolone has the highest nitrogen retention, right? Yeah. Uh, Trembolone does some other things with cortisol that's kind of make it stronger, but it's not doing more nitrogen necessarily. It's um, more of an anti-catabolic, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So you want to dig into the amino acid pool a little bit, Kurt? Sure. So you, we have... The human body or all mammals have basically a pool of amino acids that's it's in our body all the time. It's what we're constantly losing from, though. But you also cannot pull from those amino acids to make muscle. 
So this is again, why it's for an athlete, for anyone, you need to intake protein daily because you're basically replacing that pool plus that extra 10%, then we'll go to muscle. That pool is critical for life. That's kind of the basis of your immune system. So for guys like you and I, where you have extra muscle mass, you can stand to lose some, be fine. But for the average person, there's once they've lost 20% of their muscle mass or their amino acid pool, there's severe health problems. And then after that, it, be, it becomes deadly. And that's actually what we see in a lot of terminal diseases and cancer and HIV and stuff. It's a lot of times it's the muscle mass loss at the end that actually kills them because their immune system just is shot. Yeah. And is that why they prescribe like, growth hormone? Yeah. Well, growth hormone does not just that, but it, when you have AIDS, your cortisol is really high and you have something called Fox, a forkhead box gene that's expressed. You and I just don't express that gene. When you huge, a huge bolus of growth hormone, it makes your blood sugar go up. And so it makes the cortisol go down. So you're forcing a situation and then it's also going to keep the amino acid pool stable. Oh, so it's doing a couple of things. Whereas like you wouldn't necessarily want to use 18 units of growth hormone in one shot before bed, right? If you were going to use it, you would split it up or right. maybe not even use 18 units. 18 units seems a little excessive. Unless you're Chase. Chase Irons. Yeah, I was going to say, unless you're Chase, it's different. But um, 18 units I know I couldn't it. tolerate 18. I wouldn't be able to feel my hands. <laughs> I tried it like for two days and my hands were completely numb. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how he does the 18. But yeah, so that's, uh, but, and that's why anabolics used to be used, right? Anavar, things like that. Nandrolone were used for these things too, just to help hold. Because if once you've lost your muscle mass, it's done. And same with burn victims. Their metabolism speeds up when they're recovering from a burn. So the muscle mass comes off really fast. And this is why we're running higher anabolic loads at the end of contest prep too, right? Because food's not there, right? Right, because we're food's not there, and we're we're trying we're going to increase workload. We're trying to prevent breakdown of tissue. Yeah, I know. I think Colton said in a video once, or or on a reel, he was talking about higher androgen load during bulking, and I I always I always felt it was more important to run it during a cutting. Cycle. Yeah, I mean, that's been my body, philosophy right? too. I mean, the food is there for bulking. Yeah, I need less in the off season. So okay. Generally, I, was thinking, I mean, that's how I always felt. I feel like you're really just, it's like a traffic cop. You're kind of just helping the food go yep. to the right place. But when you're dieting, like right now, your body is being assaulted from every direction. It's the last thing it wants to do is lose more fat and, and hold on to your muscle. Yeah. And I tend to layer on more anabolics as I get deeper into contest prep now i have a framework for contest prep cycles but i don't go into it with you know mm -hmm. for myself personally i just react just so for example i've held the orals off i just started just a day or two ago for three and a half weeks out so i haven't needed it so far but i noticed my strength starting to decline and look like i was maybe losing some tissue so i put it in to help put anavar in to help counteract that yep. and, and promote additional nitrogen retention yeah, Anavar will help your thyroid speed up a little bit too. Thyroid, yeah. By default, too. yeah. Yep, so so for bodybuilders, for our, our, our community, protein is obviously very important. It's the one thing, though, I would say, and it's going to upset people, at least from what I've seen, is you, it's quality of protein. So it's really, really difficult to be vegan or vegetarian. I would say there's no way... To, to be optimal being vegan or vegetarian. You can do it, but the guy who is eating animal proteins is probably going to beat you every time, I would say, in, in the in the long run, just because of the way things are shaking out. And for the keto and carnivore guys, it's the fat content is what gets people in trouble. That you know, it's if you're a lack of glucose. Lack of glucose. So we're trying to manipulate body composition. So we know that protein won't make you fat, but the things that come along with that protein can. And that's why vegan and meat-based diet, meat-only based diets are are not optimal for bodybuilding where we're trying to promote optimal body composition. Yep. So that would be my takeaway from that. And as far as eat what we need, I mean, what I'm hearing from you, maybe I need to eat a little bit more as I've gotten older. I haven't found the need to do so, but you want to find that sweet spot enough where I think you're growing, but not so much that you can't digest your food. Yeah. I would say the sarcopenia though, that I talked about is going to be ameliorated by anabolic. anabolic. So if someone's on, even if someone's on TRT, it should probably balance that out where they don't necessarily need as much. But yeah. you know, if you, if anyone, you know, that's listening has a parent that's in their seventies or eighties, it's, it's very important they get adequate protein. 
believe me, I've gone as high as 600 grams of protein a day before, and I saw no difference in my physique. No. Zero. No. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you're probably not hurting anything doing it if you want. One thing I did want to address before we go is the whole myth that protein destroys kidneys. Okay. And so it's only been shown in people with chronic kidney disease. Right. I only have one kidney. I was born with one kidney called unilateral renal agenesis. And I've been using creatine as a supplement since 1996, since it came out literally. And I've eaten at least 200 grams of protein every single day since then. So whatever that is, was it 30 something years? Mm -hmm. And my kidney function is totally fine. So it doesn't, it's never been shown to have any, you know, unless someone is in, in the middle of having actual kidney failure. You know, yeah. Kidney, if you're, you know, folks, I don't want to tell you different. that you yeah. should be eating protein. If you're in kidney failure, that you definitely need to, because your body's not filtering things correctly then. So the, what is it, the glomeri or what yeah. if I'm saying that the are, filtration rate is just off being obese. Yeah. Does that as well too. yeah. So that's a different set of circumstances. But if you're a healthy person, eating yep. extra protein is not going to hurt you. But I, like I said before, I want to kind of find that sweet spot in the middle where I'm getting a little more than what I need to cover my bases and not so much that I'm affecting my digestion and making it hard to eat. Also, breaking the bank with the budget. Yeah. I want to save my money for money. growth hormone. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, that's that's sort of the sweet spot with with dieting is, is to find it. And that, for me, I found it's in that gram to a gram and a quarter per pound of body weight is what I found that works well for me. Yeah. And I feel like you can generally tell too, right? When you start getting sore and yeah. you can feel that when you're not taking enough in. You ever had yeah. those days where you're like lower? Yeah. And, I, and like I said, I have pushed up a little bit more towards the end of contest prep. You know, I'm at 360, 370 grams of direct protein so i'm probably yeah. more like I mean, 400 your body's like under attack right now so right right so that's a little little bit different of a scenario than the off season i don't need as much since we have carbohydrates in play and carbs and yeah. insulin are yeah where are your carbs sparing. now what's the highest your carbs are now uh, i'm doing a high carb day today it's a thousand wow good for you so okay. um my medium days now are at 225 there you go. that's great yeah my low days are Zero. Well, it happens. Zero. Close. Yeah, those are some fat burning days. That definitely burn <laughs> fat. <on laughs> you wake days. up very light. All right. Any parting words on protein, Kurt? Before no, we just think, wrap this up, know, like most things, right? Moderation. I don't think it needs to be so extreme high. I don't think it needs to be extreme low. I don't think it needs to be looked at like it's dangerous to consume an adequate amount. I think people should get labs. Right? You should check things yep. like your kidney function. If this is a concern yep. of yours, you know, I like and to obviously say optimization. We want to optimize where we're at. Yeah. And work with a coach, right? You know, both Paul and I can help you with your diet. If it's something you, you really don't understand how to set up your food, you know, how to utilize yep. these things. Where people see, and I think guys get, I get a little frustrated with because guys seem to be obsessed with the PEDs part of it. I'm sure you're getting that right now, Kurt. But where I've seen guys absolutely transform and change their physiques is through learning how to diet and manipulate their body composition yeah. through food. Yeah. Everything I've done on contest prep this year has been largely because of food. Yep. It's not, and I'm not doing anything special or secret with the, with the, with the PEDs. It's very straightforward stuff and I'm taking very little fat burners. It's just purely understanding how my body responds to food and manipulating food. So yep. food is the most important part and you want to coach with experience to help you with that. Yeah. I feel like that's, and that's the learning curve, right? Is when you, when everyone starts doing this, the first thing they do is push the PEDs up, right? And their food sucks. Yep. And then they think it's just a matter of more gear. And it's yeah, and it, generally and less like, gear and better food. They still look like crap. Yeah. <laughs> I went through it. I've done it before yeah, myself. I think everybody has. Yeah, we have to go through that journey and learn the hard way. All right, folks, cool. if you want to get a hold of Kurt for coaching, it is... AtomicLifeCoaching.com. Atomic Life Coaching. And Kurt you know where to get me. On Instagram. Yep. And I'm going to put all of our contact information in yep. the video description below. Thank you for watching. Cool. Thanks.